Mark and Michelle, ATF agents arrived within the past hour. You might be able to see them in the distance there. They are joined by the FBI. They were called here by the Orange County Sheriff's Department to assist in this investigation. Uh, authorities uh, say that this uh, call came in just after 1 o'clock this afternoon. The explosion just shook area businesses. The actual building where the explosion took place was 11 Marablu, uh, and that, again, uh, witnesses described it as shaking the windows. People who uh, got up to look outside their office windows nearby described seeing flames. This blast killed one person. That body, according to authorities, was found inside the building where the explosion happened. That building, we're told, is a medical building, fully operational. Three others suffered injuries. The uh, injuries, the condition of the two are still not known. One did, uh, one of the three did suffer smoke inhalation. Authorities say that they will be interviewing uh, those people as, as uh, witnesses. At 1.05 p.m. on May 15, 2018, an explosion ripped through a commercial building in Alyssa Viejo, California, about 50 miles or 80 kilometers south of Los Angeles. Explosions in commercial spaces can happen for a number of reasons depending on the type of businesses operating in them. Not unlike residential properties, there can also be a gas leak that can lead to explosions happening. Due to this explosion causing a death and numerous injuries, authorities began investigating the incident to make sure they weren't dealing with a crime, and when they found explosives at the scene, they quickly knew they were dealing with a murder. This is Monsters. On May 15, 2018, 48-year-old Eldiko Kroniak was at her business in Alyssa Viejo, like any other workday. She owned a day spa where she specialized in skin care and facial treatments. Eldiko was born in Hungary and trained there to become a licensed esthetician and moved to the United States in the 90s in order to make her dream a reality. She had been married and had a college-aged son, but she had divorced her husband years earlier. She had been taking care of her mother, who was suffering from dementia. The spa was located in a commercial office building that housed a number of other businesses, such as a chiropractor, a masseuse, and a bankruptcy lawyer. Two customers, a mother and daughter, were in the spa with El Dico, having just finished up their treatments. As they went to the front counter to pay, they saw El Dico pick up a package from a pile of mail and tear it open. As soon as she did, it exploded, destroying the inside of the office and sending flames and smoke everywhere. Shattered glass covered everything. The surrounding offices were damaged, with the neighboring chiropractor's office also destroyed. The two women were knocked to the ground before running out of the building. They were later treated for burns and lacerations, which made them lucky as the explosion instantly killed El Dico. Parts of her body would be found inside the office and as far away as the parking lot. As police arrived on the scene, people from nearby offices were running to safety. A preschool from across the street evacuated and took the children to a nearby Target store where their parents could pick them up. Due to the idea that explosives could be involved, federal investigators were brought in and they found a 9-volt battery which was embedded in the ceiling, a cell phone, melted duct tape, and some wires. It was confirmed that El Dico had been the victim of a package bomb, but nobody knew who would want the friendly spa owner dead. We do not believe at this time that this was an accident. We believe the victim is El Dico Krasniak, 40 years old, from Tribuco Canyon. El Dico is believed to be the owner of the day spa. The injured victims are recovering at a hospital. They're currently undergoing surgery and are expected to survive. Investigators are still working to confirm whether or not this was an intentional act. We are, investi we are however, investigating this as a crime, and Sheriff's Homicide is the lead investigator in this case. We do not know the motive behind the case at this time. Three search warrants were served earlier this morning, one at the business on Marablu, uh, one in the city of Long Beach, and one in Tribuco Canyon. At this time, there are no arrests. We can't 
uh, confirm or deny what's, that she's targeted. We do know that an explosion happened at the location. The, invest, the investigation is ongoing, and we will try to determine motive. That question was answered when investigators heard about Stephen Beal, a 64-year-old retired management consultant who not only had recently broken up with El Dico, but was also a partial owner of her spa business. On top of that, Stephen's favorite hobby was building and launching large-scale model rockets along with homemade pyrotechnics. I could tell you more about him, but it seems he can tell you himself. Hi, I'm Stephen Beal. This is my video submission for The Real Deal. I designed this to let us get a little better acquainted in 90 seconds. Now, I was married for 27 years. I have four children, and I have two young granddaughters. And I've recently started dating a wonderful woman, and I'm really excited, I gotta tell you, to, to see where that journey ends. I made this pig. Also, I'm a man of faith, I'm active in my church, and I'm active with a lot of volunteer projects. My closest friend is also named Steve, by the way. When we met, we were freshmen in high school, and we still keep in contact. I prefer dogs to cats. In fact, I've had a dog as a part of the family for almost my entire life. What about acting, you ask? I'm passionate about my acting. I train at the Berg Studios with one of the most influential teachers that I have ever met. I'm also currently in rehearsal for uh, Arsenic and Old Lace and playing Dr. Einstein. I've been cast in a lot of indie stuff, some of which is filmed and some hasn't. I believe though that an actor has to have a life outside of the camera. Art illuminates life, but also life illuminates art. And so that's it. That's the end of my time. 90 seconds really goes fast. Steven fancied himself an actor and made a biography video along with a demo reel. You know, I thought that your competition would balk at taking a handout from me to secure this job for you. I call it more than a handout. I'm very grateful for everything that you've done. He's always been the sort of man that could be bought, but never cheaply. I just never thought the same about you. It's the first time that I've seen like the whole film like that. Yeah, good. Hey, Brian, could you get all those DI boxes put away, please? Mm -hmm. And um, watch the ribbon mic, please. We just got that back from the shop. Okay. In 2016, Stephen and El Dico had met on Tinder, and they spent the next few years traveling and spending time together. Stephen had become a partner in her business, but it seems as though by 2018, their relationship was beginning to sour. El Dico wanted to see other people, and Stephen was jealous. Ildiko was also not doing great financially, which may have become a burden on Steven, though their finances aren't really detailed outside of some documents showing a bankruptcy on Ildiko's part. Investigators got a warrant to search Steven's house, and there they found a number of explosive components. There were 130 pounds of explosive chemicals, as well as electric matches and wires. When Steven was interviewed, a couple of members of the bomb squad asked him about his experience with explosives. What have you done in the past? What, what do you know in your knowledge base? Okay, so um, I, most of you know, where that all comes from is rocketry. Okay. And I had at one point thought about perhaps getting into like making my own rocket motors. But I never actually did it. I, I ordered the, the red and the uh, hydroxyl terminated polybutadine or whatever. Some of the coloring chemicals, um, don't remember what they are. Um, you know, some of the oxidizer and stuff. But it just, like I'm looking at this thing going at, I'm not interested in fiddling with that. Um, and then I, I had gotten, is it American Fireworks News or something like that? I uh, had a subscription, monthly subscription to that, and had thought, you know, I could join that club that, that like, builds fireworks and, and that kind of thing. Um, Would that be, like, launching mortars and stuff like that? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what's um, the biggest mortar? Did you make mortars? What's the biggest mortar? I never actually got around to making mortars. Okay. I made the, I, I made the stars. Okay. Um, but I never got around to making the mortars. Okay. And I made my own black powder. Okay. Um in the in the garage, there I don't know if it's still there, but there used to be like a rock tumbler, like ball mill kind of uh -huh. thing that I would use to make the black powder. So I put the chemicals in there and I spritz it with a little water and let it tumble for a, a, like a week or whatever. I'm not I don't even remember the process anymore. Okay. But 
and then and then you know we would make uh, like uh, fountains and and you know stuff like that out of it. Um, but after 9/11, it's like I know we're not doing this anymore because this is not really a politically good climate for for this kind of thing. You get in a you know a lot of trouble. He claimed that he stopped making homemade fireworks after 9-11 because the political climate wasn't good. He then claimed the chemicals that were found had been there since then. Detectives continued talking to Stephen about the details surrounding his involvement with Ildico and her business. It was during that interview that he revealed himself to be possibly the most pompous, arrogant person I've ever covered. Valerie looked at me, I think, yesterday. And we were talking about, you know, like life goal, uh, immediate life goal right now is to get to the point where we look at this particular set of events and can joke about it because we think it's funny because it's not. Mm -hmm. And then she said, she said, you know, actually, when you get past all of this, you need to do a stand up comedy routine about it because there's a lot of really, you know, potentially humorous anecdotes that are just wrapped up in the most intense life situations. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if the audience can relate to, to what you're going through and it's delivered in, in a you know humorous manner, you know, you're going to win. And, you know, even if I come out on the, on the end of this and the jury says he's not guilty or whatever, you know, the court of public opinion is not going to be, you know, at least anywhere near 100% behind what their decision, you know. And, and then she's right, a stand-up comedy routine would help out a lot. Yeah. You know, people, people love to be entertained. He seems to enjoy spending his time talking to investigators about the rockets he's built and the screenplay he's working on. Basically, he seems to love to talk about himself and you can tell he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. But he isn't as displayed here. Going back to something you just mentioned, you talked about the size of the package that she would have had to have opened in, in order to have done that kind of damage. Um, why would you assume it was a package that she opened? Because it's in the news reports. That she opened a package? It said it was a package. Is that the only way that a package could be, could be utilized? I don't know. I no, I I suppose you could have a, a timer in there or a cell phone or something that would you know that would trigger it. Mm. Uh it's just package for me means you open it. Mm. I mean, that's my assumption. When I get a package in the mail I open it. Mm. Uh, other than that, I you know I don't know. Oh, okay. Because you had just said that and I just didn't know. And again, my experience with explosives is very minimal. So, uh, I mean, I didn't, <clears throat> me, my, personally, hadn't made that assumption. And, and then you, you obviously, not necessarily with explosives, but with explosive material, I have way more experience than I do. And you kind of inferred from everything that it was a package. It, it was, it was a package that she opened, yeah. I mean, it said she was in close proximity to it. Um, you know, it was a package. I open packages. It's one of the highlights of my day to get a package in. Steven slipped up and talked about the package that Eldico opened, and the investigators wanted to know how he knew it was a package. He said it was in the news, but it's not clear if he really heard about the package in the news or not. I found a news clip from just after they started reporting that the bomb was a package, but I'm not sure what time that aired in relation to when Steven was being interviewed. But even then, he's kind of specific about talking about her opening the package, which definitely feels like he knows more about it than he should. It could have easily just been a bomb in a package with a timer. Why is he so sure she opened it? Because that's the way he designed it. Authorities arrested Stephen and charged him with possessing an unregistered destructive device, but he wasn't charged with anything related to the murder of his ex-girlfriend. The chemicals found were commonly used to build rockets and legally didn't qualify as destructive devices, so it wasn't long before the district attorney dropped the charges against him. But that didn't mean investigators were done. They were still putting the pieces together to charge him with the murder of Ildiko Kronjak. 
I mean, his ex-girlfriend had just been killed with a homemade bomb and he just happened to conveniently have a bunch of explosive ingredients in his house. Putting those pieces together wasn't rocket science. <laughs> As they dug, more suspicions arose that Steven was a killer, but these didn't have anything to do with Ildiko. It turned out that Steven's wife, Christine Beal, had died mysteriously in 2008. According to Steven, they had been moving furniture when she fell down a flight of stairs and a table landed on her stomach. It seemed she survived for a little while and then died three weeks later. During her autopsy, it was discovered that her cause of death was pancreatitis, electrolyte imbalance, and chronic lead intoxication, and the medical examiner ruled her death undetermined. The insurance company that held her life insurance policy initially denied the claim, stating they did not believe her death was an accident, so Stevens sued them and won $350,000. A report written by the medical examiner after Christine's death said that Stephen was uncooperative and didn't want to give hospital staff information about his wife. There wasn't much that authorities could do about that case, but for the bombing, they painstakingly tested the chemicals used in the package bomb as well as the wiring found at the scene. Unsurprisingly, they matched the chemicals and wires found at Stephen's house. Surveillance footage at a nearby CVS pharmacy showed Stephen using cash to purchase a 9-volt battery just six days before the bombing. Not only that, but that specific type of battery had only been in production for two months, making it that much less likely that someone else had just happened to have purchased the exact same type of battery for the bomb. He had also purchased three cardboard boxes that matched the size and shape of the package seen by the two customers before the explosion. People close to Ildiko said that she had expressed concern about Stephen, telling them that he was controlling and jealous. She told them that he had made threats against her. He was arrested again in March of 2019. He was charged with malicious destruction of a building that included death. Investigators believe that Stephen, who had keys to the spa, left the package in the business while Ildiko was out of town while she visited family in Hungary. She had just returned from that trip when the bombing occurred. Cell phone location records show that he went to the spa multiple times while she was out of town. Computer records also showed that he was keeping tabs on her by regularly visiting her social media and an online scheduling app she used. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, Stephen maintained his innocence. During the trial, the prosecution laid out the means, the motive, and the opportunity that Stephen had to commit the crime. Still, a jury was deadlocked and the judge declared a mistrial. Any hope that Stephen would have of getting away with murder was erased during the second trial where, after 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury found him guilty. The judge sentenced Stephen Beale to life plus an additional 30 years in federal prison. Federal prison has no parole, so he will never be released. Stephen Beale murdered his ex-girlfriend in one of the most depraved and despicable ways possible. He blew her up in the business she owned, a salon, using a bomb disguised as a male package. In the process, he also severely injured two other people, customers in the salon who were there preparing for a wedding. They will have to live with the trauma from this event for the rest of their lives. This murderous act was not only callous, not only cowardly, but incredibly reckless. He endangered the lives of everyone in the building he blew up, which included people and businesses. He endangered a daycare center, which is across the way, which had to be evacuated. Children and teachers evacuated that day. But Mr. Beale did not care. He didn't care about any of it. In fact, he did everything he could to avoid being caught. He lied to investigators. He thought he'd outsmarted the investigators. He thought with his superior expertise in bomb making and rocketry, he could get away with this. But he was sorely mistaken. Not only will Stevens spend the rest of his life in prison, but he has also pleaded guilty to wire fraud, social security fraud, and concealment of bankruptcy assets. 
Stephen failed to report the $350,000 insurance payout that he received after his wife's murder, uh, I mean, death. He also scammed the social security system out of $1.3 million in disability payments. So, not only is Stephen Beale a horrible, murdering monster, he's also a sleazy scam artist. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.